are holy. <clears throat> you are holy.
Seven six in Christ alone. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my life, my strength, my soul. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What Yeah. 
Number five. Number five. Listen to our hearts. Number five. How do you explain? How do you describe? A love that goes from east to west. You know all our hopes. You know all our fears. And words cannot express the love.
<laughs> Number 82, bless the Lord, O my soul. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Bless the Lord, O my soul.
uh, Light the Fire event. We started this five years ago as an opportunity to challenge our young people, challenge their way of thinking, to give them some tools for their tool bag as they head out to school. And uh, we're thankful for Brother Rob to come down. He's drove about 10 hours uh, with his wife to call his, his daughter Hannah and, and their son Jared. Uh, we're thankful for them uh, to be here. Uh, hopefully y'all enjoyed the food, the time of fellowship that we had. Fazoli's always does a great job, and we uh, we appreciate them bringing that food out here to us. Uh, thank the men for leading the, leading singing here this evening. Um, if you haven't done so already, please silence your cell phones. That would be greatly appreciated. Uh, Brother Ross uh, up in Willette, Tennessee, uh, been there for quite a while. He loves young people. Uh, and, and he's going to challenge our thinking tonight as we talk about dating and about courtship and those types of things that's going to help us out. Uh, our brother Chris Bundrick from the Dasher Congregation, he's going to lead our minds in prayer. And then Brother Wes Hazel from uh, Forest Park is going to lead us in uh, one more song, uh, Light the Fire, which is not in your songbooks. And after that, then we'll have our speaker, Brother Rob. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day and thank you for all the wonderful blessings and bless us, good Lord. And just thank you so much for this time tonight that we can come and be a part of this event, Lord. Just thank you so much for our young people and all that they mean to us, Lord. And thank you for all the parents and congregations for bringing them tonight and having them here, Lord. And just thank you so much for them, Lord. Just be your brother Rob as he brings our lesson, Lord. And thank you for him and his family for coming down, Lord. And just Help us to take advantage these next few days that he'll be around, Lord, just to make sure that we're there to listen to him, Lord, just to glorify you, Lord. Just continue to be with our country, Lord, and just help it to, to grow and just help it to be a better nation, Lord, and just continue to be with us and watch over us, Lord. Just forgive us when we sin. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 I stand to praise you. isn't as far as it might, might, I might think, but you've come from other states to be here, so this is great to be here tonight together, and 
and uh, to have an opportunity to study from the Word of God. We're talking about a topic tonight. It's very important. And I, in fact, of all the topics we could discuss tonight, if you said, "Hey, preacher, just you just pick one. You got a group of Christian young people. What topic would you like to address with teenagers tonight?" You, you hit it. This is it. This is one that we really need to pay very close attention to. And, and, and for some reason, uh, uh, there's not been a lot of teaching about this topic at home, at church. So I hope tonight that we'll say something and, and direct you to the Word of God. And you'll leave here saying, those are some principles in God's Word that are going to help me be more spiritual. They're going to help me go to heaven. And so, uh, I, again, this is, this, is a, this is a Bible-centered lesson. In fact, as I begin tonight, I want to go to my second slide real quickly. We are people of the book. That, that's yeah. why you're here. And, and so, so you're looking for a Bible to answer tonight. You're saying, I want to see a dust set the Lord. You show me a Bible verse for your topic. And, and, and the title of the topic tonight is Dating and Courtship. So I want to see a dust set the Lord. You, you take me to the Bible. If the Bible says it, I'm going to do it. But the problem is this. When we deal with this topic, there's not always a dust set the Lord for every Aspect of dating and courtship. In fact, I want to—I want you to understand something tonight: that the words themselves are not in the Bible. And although I, I believe the Scripture lays out principles for every area of life, there is no there is no dot to dot tonight that's going to tell you exactly how this is going to look in your life. So if you came here tonight, say, "I'm a preacher. I want I want the Scripture." You tell me exactly. How this is going to look, you're a young lady, how, how, how this is going to look when I get married, I'm a young man, how, how, how am I going to get to the process of walking down the aisle, or I'm going to see that beautiful bride come down the aisle, I want to know step by step what it's going to look like. I, I'm going to disappoint you a little bit tonight because I can't give you that, and God's Word doesn't give you that. But here's what God's Word does. God's Word is going to give you the principles to follow so that you can have a holy relationship and prepare yourself for marriage. I want to give you the... I believe the Word of God has all the principles that are needed. It may not lay out a paved road. You may not have a highway in front of you that's that with no bumps. And it's, it's a straight path. But I promise you this. The principles that we're going to study tonight. If you apply those in your relationship. Whether or not you're in a relationship right now. Or you're going to be in one. Preparing for marriage. I promise you it's going to draw you closer to God. I want you to think of these two diametrically opposed pictures and these two statements. And I'm going to ask you to think about this. Right now or into the future, are you going to be practicing for divorce? Is, are the relationships you're going to pursue going to be those relationships that set you up for divorce? Now I want you to think about divorce. What happens is I just get tired of them. And when I get tired of them, I just discard them. And so divorce has a lot of components to it. They don't know how to work things out. They don't know how to have... There's no communication that's, that's productive. And so you have this, this, this system of practicing for divorce. I think we see this system in our society. It's, it's, it, divorce just doesn't happen tomorrow. Divorce, young people, is something that you set up right now in your life. It's habits. It's, it's, it's in relationships. You know, And, and there, there's this ongoing uh, scenario where you're practicing for it. Because you're treating the relationships you have now... You're setting yourself up for a divorce later. Now then there's this other statement about preparing for marriage. Now, these are two opposed concepts. The relationship I'm going to pursue or I'm pursuing now is a relationship that sets me up for a marriage that helps me go to heaven. I want you to think about these two, these two thoughts. Because what we're going to discuss this evening is going to go down one of these paths. You're going to go down one of these paths. As I said before, as we look at this together, we're looking at a system that's not necessarily so easily paved. I, again, if you're, if you're thinking to not listen, I'm going to come to this class, I'm, I'm going to read the material. And I'm just going to have this beautiful relationship and you've got all these visions and pictures of your mind of, 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 of almost perfection. You're going to be disappointed because what we're going to talk about is not so easily laid out. In fact... There has been a lot of discussion through the years about even the terms themselves. And I appreciate Tyler, as I assume that, that the brethren there laid this topic out. And you didn't call it, this, these are the principles of courtship. These are the principles of dating. And then everybody takes sides. It says, I tell you what, this is, I'm on the dating side or I'm on the courtship side. And then some of you are thinking automatically, you know, of, of counting on. You, oh, I love that show. And you know, the, you know, some of the courtship families, and that's what I want. 
And, and we, we get in these camps, and we divide up, and then we start arguing about it. I had a young lady come to me at Polishing the Pulpit several years ago, and she says, she says uh, Mr. Rob, she says, in my house, we call it, uh, we call it, uh, we don't call it dating. We call it, we don't call it courting, we call it, uh, we call it dording. <laughs> she said, we just combine the two terms. I said, hey, if that's what you want to call it, that's all right. Let me give you some terms. I'm going to throw them out. Some of you use the term dating. Some of you are going to use the term courting. You know, sometimes we mean the same thing when we use those two words. We mean the same thing. And we don't even know it. Some people are going to use the word caving. They're just going to combine the two. Some are going to call it dording. But in matters of personal liberty, what we all need to do is understand we need to love. This is not an avenue where we need to divide up. This is where I want you to, to be when, I, when you leave this, this class tonight. Regardless of what you call this, and I'm going to call it something. I'm going to give you the reasons why. I'm going to define my terms. But regardless of what you call this tonight, we should all agree there are Bible principles that Christians must follow. We've got to follow these principles. Now, it may look a little different in your life than it does in my life, but there are principles that must we must adhere to them. Tonight, I want you to focus on those Bible principles. Now, as we go through the lesson tonight, I am going to define my terms. Because when I use terms, it's important that you understand what I'm saying. And because these terms are not Bible terms, if I said, oh, turn your Bibles, go to, the, go to the verse that talks about dating, and you'd be going through like this, it's just not there. Go, turn your Bibles and open to the, to the verse that says, ah, you need a court. It's not there. Because these are not Bible words. If I said, turn your Bibles to the place where it talks about baptism, well, you can turn there, and you can give me a Bible definition. And do you know what? There is, a, there is a guideline, an inspired guideline to go by. There is a right and wrong, and we can stand our ground on baptism because we know that's a Bible word. So here's what I did. I'm just going to go to Mr. Webster, and I'm going to define the terms, and I'm going to explain to you why I use these terms and concepts. Now you say, now preacher, I use the term Christian dating. I'm all for it. Use the term Christian dating. That's fine. If you want to use any of the other terms, intentional friendship, whatever you want to call this, it does not matter to me. What matters tonight is that the principles that we're going to learn, you implement them in your life. Now, here, here's a definition that I found in Miriam Webster's Dictionary. Some of you probably have this at home. Dating means to go out socially, normally beginning in high school. An appointment for a particular time, especially with a person to whom one is sexually or romantically attracted. Again, I'm just writing down what the dictionary says. To have a boyfriend or a girlfriend. Now, those are terms that you'll find if you just open up a dictionary. Now, I want to focus on the family. And, and they're, they're an organization that has done a lot of good when it comes to, to marriage and relationships. Now, I'm going to tell you up front, these are not members of the Lord's church. But they're quote-unquote Christian in, in, in thought. And they have some really good material. Here's how they defined it. A method of introduction, carrying out a premarital relationship between single man and single woman. That begins with either the man or the woman initiating with the other. That is conducted, now here's the key, outside of the formal oversight or authority of a person's family. Outside, separated from. Notice this, that may or may not have marriage as its goal. It is often recreational. Now, I'm going to, that's, the, that's how I'm using the term. That's how I'm looking at this term. Now, you may not define it that way. You may have a totally different concept of dating than that, and that's all right. I'm just telling you, this is, this is, this is how the word is being used in this particular lesson. I want you to look at the word courtship just for a minute. I'm just looking at the dictionary. I said, okay, Mr. Webster, show me the word courtship, and you tell me what it means. What well, Mr. Webster said to try to gain the love or affections of, especially to seek to marry. He says it's old fashioned to be conducting a serious emotional relationship, usually leading to marriage. Focus on the family has it like this. It is a method of introduction carrying out a premarital relation between a single man, same thing, single woman, that begins with a man approaching, going through the woman's father or family. That is conducted under the oversight of the woman's father or family. That always has marriage at its direct goal. Now when I use the term courtship, that's, that's kind of what I'm talking about. When I use the term dating, the definitions that you just used, that's kind of what I'm talking about. Now as we move through this, here's what I really want us to focus on. All right, In this audience, there are a lot of people who use a lot of different terms. Do not judge the other person's term until you know what they mean by it. 
Let them define it for you. Because we don't have a thus saith the Lord on the definition of the word. Now with that being said in the introduction, that's the least important part of this whole thing that we're going to do tonight. The most important part is this. Does God give us any help at all when it comes to relationships? Has God just left it up to us and said, you know what, you just pursue relationships in any way, shape, or form you want to pursue them. Any way you want to meet a, a young lady and get married is all right with me. Or has God, in His infinite wisdom, provided us some instruction? Has He said, listen, I'm going to give you a, an example of what it looks like. And I'm going to lay out for you some principles that you can follow in your life. I believe He's given us something. In fact, I believe if you turn your Bibles, we're going to spend a lot of time here tonight in Genesis 24. You're going to find an example of what it looks like when principles are applied. Godly principles are applied to finding a mate. Genesis chapter 24. So I want you to key in on this text. If you don't have a Bible, maybe you can make some notes. Genesis 24 is God's design, God's example of what it looks like when you apply these heavenly principles in seeking a mate. You know what I find interesting about Genesis 24? Of all the chapters in Genesis, did you realize the chapter that tells us how to find a godly mate is the longest chapter? You'd think it would be creation. You'd think God creating the world would be the longest chapter. You'd think that the account of Noah would be the longest chapter. If, I, if memory serves correctly, I believe there's 67 verses in Genesis chapter 24. Friends, God didn't have to go into 60. God could have done it in one verse. He said, Isaac, he said, he said, he could have said, Isaac and married Rebecca. But he didn't do that. He gives us 67 verses explaining every detail, all the processes up until he finds his mate. I want you to begin by going to Genesis 24. And I'm going to give you some principles. And I hope you'll write these down. I hope you'll take a picture of them, if you will. Because these are principles you need to know. So in Genesis 24, God is setting you up for a, 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 a principled relationship. So young men, young ladies, listen carefully. Parents, this is, this is where you really want to take note. This is where you want to sit down with your son and daughter and say, Okay, here are the things that you need to follow. Call it whatever you want to. But these things must be in place. Number one, relationships must involve the parents. I want you to go to Genesis 24. Abraham was old and well stricken in age. And the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. And Abraham said unto his eldest servant of the house that ruled over all that he had. Put, I pray thee, thy hand under my thigh. So I want you to notice that Abraham is, what he's doing is he's seeking a wife for his son Isaac. Now Abraham has just lost his own wife and buried her in the cave of Machpelah, chapter 23 and 19. And so, and so it is the case that Abraham, um, that Sarah has passed away. Abraham looks out to his son and says, my son needs a wife. Abraham is going to take an active approach. The first thing I want us to understand is that in the process of finding a, a spouse, young men and young ladies, it's important that your parents be involved. See, our society says something very differently. They say, no, this is an area of parents where you need to back off. Because if you push too hard, if you get involved, they're just going to rebel. Dear friends, that is an unbiblical approach. If there is ever an area of life where parents need to be involved in helping their children make wise decisions, it is seeking a lifelong spouse. This is where mom and dad have got to step up and you have trained your children to allow you to step up. Because they're of the age now where if they say no, if they, if they try to keep you away and keep you out, it's going to be very difficult to have a part in this particular matter. So you have trained them up to understand that this is very important. So Abraham was really involved. Look at verse 3. He says, I will make thee swear by the Lord God of heaven and the God of earth that thou shalt not take a wife of my son and the daughters of the Canaanite among whom I dwell. So I notice the phrase, my son. Look at verse 4. Go to my country, to my kindred, to, uh, to get a wife of my son. Now, here's what I did in my Bible. I circled the term, my son. I want, I want you to think about it, young people, just for a minute. You're the property of somebody tonight. You're the property of your mother and your father. They own you. In fact, when you look at the scriptures, the scriptures speak very plain about this. There are parental involvement, guidelines, 
ownership, if you will, between a parent and their children. I want to share with you a couple verses. Look at Deuteronomy 7 and 3. Nor shall you make your marriages with them. You shall not give your daughter. Do you know my daughter? My daughter's name is Hannah. She's my daughter. She's not your daughter. She doesn't belong to anybody else in this room. She belongs to her mother and I. And I need to behave as a father so that she wants to belong to me. And I have a responsibility to show her leadership and to care for her in a very special way. And so she says, don't give your daughter, your daughter to their son, nor take their daughters for your son. And so there is a special relationship here. I want you to go to a New Testament passage because some of you say, well, that's just old fashioned. You know, it's not old-fashioned. Dear friends, it's in the Old and New Testament. The Bible says this, 1 Corinthians 7 and 38. So then he that giveth her in marriage doeth well. But he that giveth her not in marriage doeth better. What's the key? Giveth her. Did you notice there's a giving in marriage? That, that, that a father gives his daughter away in marriage? Friends, we still, to some extent, we still try to maintain some familiarity with that giving in marriage concept. If you think of a, a wedding, you're going to think about the giving of the marriage. Stay with me. Go to another passage. Matthew 22 and 30. The Bible says we're in this resurrection. They neither marry or given in marriage. So if you're given, what does that imply? If you have given me, let's say tonight. Let's say you're a soccer player tonight. I'm a soccer coach. That's why I'm limping. I just had ACL surgery. It causes you a lot of grief. All right. Say you're a soccer player tonight. And you have given me your soccer ball. What does that imply? It was yours. You gave it to me. Given means that there's an ownership there. Who gives? Who gives this woman in marriage? Does this picture look familiar? How many of you have seen this? Been to a wedding? You've seen this right here. The preacher, come on, guys. You've been to a marriage. How many of you have been to a wedding and you've seen something like this? And the preacher says to you this. Who gives this woman in marriage? Does that have any significance whatsoever? What does it mean to you? Young lady, someday, listen to this, the preacher is going to stand before the audience and he's going to say, who gives this woman in marriage? Are you ready for that question? Because, dear friends, for some of us, it may be very well the answer that we cannot truthfully say, my father. Because you have never been under the authority of your father. You haven't been for years. You have not listened to him. All this is is a formality. Who gives this woman in marriage? Well, if you have not had that relationship with your parent and respected their God life, you cannot answer this question honestly. We're talking, of course, about parents who are, are godly parents. You say, well, listen, preacher, I, I don't have Christian parents. I, I, I can deal with that separately. You have a case like that. I'm going to, I'm going to encourage you strongly to seek out a, a godly, a, a, a godly a woman, a godly man in your life, an elder, a deacon, a preacher, someone you can you can bond with, someone that, that can help give you guidance. But the key is, who gives this woman in marriage is important because you haven't given yourself away. You understand that I have a, a responsibility to my parents. What about this, young man? In Genesis two and twenty four, does it not say? That you're to leave father and mother. But you know some young men have left father and mother a long time ago. And I'm not talking about moving from Colorado. I'm not talking about that. You know what I'm talking about? I'm talking about a young man who disrespects his father. I'm talking about a young woman. She, might, she still might live in the house, but she doesn't listen to dad anymore. And dad has been telling her, listen, you're not to be out past this time period. You're not to be involved in this activity. These are the boundaries. These are the rules. And she's just disregarded them. He has not listened. There is a parental responsibility in relationships. Parents must be. They are involved. Dear friends, and you can call it whatever you want to, but this is a principle laid out in the Word of God. In Genesis 24, Abraham was directly involved in helping Isaac find his mate. I want you to notice the second point. It's in Genesis 24. If you just read Genesis 24, you'll find that God is screaming at us. He, he, is, he, is, he is giving us principles that are going to help us eternally. Because the person you choose, this, this process is going to have a bearing, a heavy bearing on whether or not you go to heaven. I will say this tonight, that of all the things you're going to do in life, this process of getting and finding your mate will have the most bearing on your eternal soul. 
I want you to consider that. This is an extremely important matter. Number one is parental. Number two is pointed. Look at, look at the Bible. Look at verse number three. I will make thee swear by the Lord God of the heaven, the God of the earth, that thou shalt not take a wife. See, it's pointed towards the direction. You've got to find a wife. In fact, in verse 4, I want you to go find a wife for my son. You see, this, this is not the, 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 the dating game as some, as some have turned it. This, this is not about relationship revolver. It is, this isn't throwing the dice. Dear friends, this is a very serious matter. Abraham was not concerned if Isaac found a date. Friends, he was concerned if he found a godly mate. This is, an, this is, a, this is a matter of so much importance. This is not a social experiment. This is not, I want to be popular. So if I'm going to be popular, I've got to have, you know, I've got to date this person or I'm going to go with this person. These are not even the bearings or considerations. We're talking about pointing yourself towards marriage. We're looking for a, someone that can help me go to heaven. I want you to consider this. In Proverbs 18, 22, it says, Whosoever findeth, oh, look, look at the term. Whosoever findeth a what? A Friday night date? Is that, is that what God's concerned? I, I want you to be socially accepted. I want you to have a, you go out and have a great time. No, he says, I want you to find a wife. I, I want you to find someone who's going to help you go to heaven. Whosoever findeth a wife, findeth a good thing and obtaineth favor of the Lord. So it's pointed towards marriage. In fact, it's very important that we understand that marriage is the end game. I want you to look at this picture for a minute. The dating game brings broken hearts. I'm talking about the game. This, not may, this may not be how you define it. But when I look at the world, this is what I see. I see a revolving door of broken hearts, emotional scars, headaches, hurt aches, a box of tissues. I see a, I see a system out there. It's, it's entirely broken. I, I, see a lot of, I see a lot of young ladies that have these scars that... that in fact, they maintain them for years. I'm here to say there's a better way than this. What we see commonly being practiced in our nation today is hurtful. And it's not preparing people for marriage. Friends, they are practicing for someday a divorce. I'm going to put forward to you that there is a better way. In fact, when you're at the, when you're at the altar... If that's all you've done all your life, you play the dating game, and every time someone hurts your feelings, every time you don't get along, I'm just going to get me another boyfriend. I'll go find me another girlfriend. In fact, you might have six, seven, eight, or ten. When you get down that wedding aisle, and when you're standing there with that person you're supposed to live with for the rest of your life, dear friends, all the people that you have played that game with, they're standing with you. You say, well, they're not even there. No, they're with you here. They're with you here. Because you have gone through this process of hurt and heartache. And let me tell you what, these things just don't disappear in your life. Someday they may come again. So I'm, I'm asking you, don't play a game with this. I'm asking you to think about the seriousness and think about the, think about the principles that God's giving you. That you're, you're looking for someone that you can spend eternity with. So much more serious than this. It's pointed towards marriage. When I'm looking for a relationship like this, I'm looking for someone I can marry. I'm not going to play a game. Because those games can hurt me. Number three, it's placed. Genesis chapter 24, verses 3 and 4. I want you to look especially at verse number 4. The Bible says, but thou shalt go to my country. I want you to circle the word my. I want you to go to my kindred. Circle the word my. I want you to take a son to my son Isaac. And here's where we're at. I want you to consider that the servant was asked, well listen to this, to travel 850 miles to find his mate. Have you ever wondered why God wanted him to travel 850 miles? Couldn't he just go down the road and find somebody? I mean, surely there was someone in the village next to him. 850 miles? Traditionally, notice the safety net is this. Well listen, if I can just find a Christian... You know, I don't have to go too far. I've got Christians in the church I'm at. There are Christians in the congregation over here. I want you to consider that you're not just looking for a Christian. Preacher, say that again. Yeah, you're not just looking for a Christian. You know, people, you're looking for a faithful Christian. You're, you're looking for someone who can help you go to heaven because just because they wear the term Christian doesn't mean that's the person that I need to spend the rest of my life with. You're looking for someone, dear friend, that shares the same value of God and His Word 
that I hope that you share. You see, it's placed in faithful Christian. You travel. If you've got to go 850 miles to find her, go 850. If you've got to go from, from Denver, Colorado, if you've got to come all the way down to Valdosta, if you've got to go from San Antonio, Texas to Nashville, Tennessee, you, you just, wherever you've got to go, you've got to go from Missouri to Henderson, Tennessee, you go. You've got to go from Missouri to wherever. You go find that young lady. Dear friends, because it's worth it. Whatever trouble it is, it's important. Now, I want you to go to another principle. We're in Genesis 24. Go down, if you would, to verse number 12. So he sends this servant out. His job is to find Isaac a wife. Now, we've looked at three principles. Number one, parental, the parental responsibility. Now, I'm not trying to make your life miserable, young people. Listen, I understand that you want some independence from mom and dad. But this is, again, one area in life that you need them more than you've ever needed them before. For every father out here, I want you to listen to me very carefully. This is not a time for you to take a back seat. This is not a time for you to say, hey, listen, you know, I've done all I can do. Mom, this is not a time for you to close your eyes and just hope things work out. Number two, it's pointed towards marriage. It's not a game. This, is, this, has, eternal, this has eternal bearings upon where you spend the rest of of life. Number three, it's placed in a very special area. Faithful Christians. Number four, I want you to look at the, the, the providential and prayerful aspect. He said, this is the servant. He's gone out looking. Look at what the servant says. Oh Lord my God, my master Abraham, I pray thee. It's a prayerful thing. I want to ask a question to how many of you, and I want to show hands. I want you to raise your hand if you're doing this. How many of you are praying, God, help me find a faithful Help me find a faithful husband. How many young ladies are praying that? Young ladies? How many young ladies are praying, young men are praying tonight? Lord, help me find a faithful Christian wife. Are you praying that prayer? Because, dear friends, we should be praying that prayer. I mean, every unmarried, every, I, I, the youngest of it, let me ask how many parents are praying? How many parents, raise your hand. How many parents are praying that their children find a faithful Christian to marry? Young people, look at that. We're praying, we're praying. This is a prayerful thing. Prayer ought to be involved in every aspect. So he says, I pray thee, send good speed this day, show kindness unto my master Abraham. He said, tell me, Lord, find a, a, a spouse. Help me find a wife for Isaac. That's what he's saying. Now I say it's prayerful and providential because what you read in Genesis 24, I've heard people say, well, you know, you, you know Genesis 24 is fine, but that's not going to happen today. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not saying that Genesis 24 is going to be replicated. I'm not saying you're going to make an 850-mile journey, go out and, and look for, for, for food and water for your, your, your livestock, and all of a sudden she's going to be there. I'm not saying that. But you know what I'm also saying? That there's nothing miraculous about Genesis 24. If you're a preacher tonight you think there's a miracle in the Genesis 24, please come show it to me. I would love for you to show Where is the miracle? Friends, there's not a miracle one in Genesis 24. But I can tell you there's the providence of God. There's a, prayer that's, there's a prayer that's offered and a prayer that's answered. And there's a God who cares. And there's a God who cares tonight if you find a faithful Christian. And I promise you this, if you're a young man and you're seeking for a faithful young lady, if you pray hard enough and, you, and if you wait long enough, you'll find her. I have no doubt about that in my mind. Young ladies, if you do the same and distrust God, I want you to look out, look at Genesis 24. Keep going. Go to verse 15 with me. Because we're, we're looking at verse 12. Now we're at verse 15. It came to pass before he had done speaking this. Behold, Rebekah, here she comes, came out, who was of, born of, uh, to Bethuel, son of Milcah, the wife of Nahor, Abraham's brother, with her pitcher in her shoulder. The damsel was very fair to look upon. Here, here's... He prays his prayer. Again, I'm not suggesting it's going to look like this. This is not a paved road. I, I can't tell you this is how it goes. Wouldn't it be great, young men, you go to bed tonight, say, Lord, I pray, give me a faithful Christian. You open your eyes and there she is. Wouldn't that be exciting? It's not going to work like that. This is an example of the, the principle, prayer, and trusting in the providence of God. Now, if the providence of God is going to work, I want you to take your Bible. You're in Genesis 24. Go to verse 57. Because when the, for the providence of God to work, there's something that has to happen. You've got to do your part. In verse 57, they called Rebekah 
They said unto her, Will you go with this man? Let's suppose Rebecca. I, I have no doubt in my mind that Rebecca had been looking for, wanting, and praying for a faithful Christian husband. I have absolutely zero doubt that she was praying this prayer. Let's suppose that Rebecca said, No, I'm not going. Let's suppose Rebecca said, No, I'm staying home. Young people, now listen to me very carefully. God cannot work providentially in your life if you're not willing to do your part. If you're not willing to be faithful to Him, if, you're not, if, you're, if, you, if your idea of prayer is this, I'm going to sit home, pray this prayer, and I'm going to wake up every morning and, and just expect my husband or my future wife to be sitting there, you're going to be waiting a long time. You have got to do your part. That, if, if that means you've got to come to a Bible camp, maybe tonight some of you young men say, I want to go to this Bible camp because it, it may be that my future wife is at this Bible camp. And you think, oh, preacher, that surely that doesn't happen. No, it happens because I can remember doing that same thing. And Wes is sick. You know, a lot of us young men, we did that same. We went to Bible camp thinking, you know, I, she, I, I can remember when my closest friend, Matt Gibson, we went to Bible camp down in ATB -E Bible camp down in South Texas. My friend Mel and Matt and I, we all got there. We were excited. This young lady, she walks out. Her name's Wendy. Wendy. Wendy walks out. Matt turns around to uh, Mel and I and said, That one's mine. I can still remember that. <laughs> that one's mine. And so Mel and I backed off. And Matt went over there. Of course, they're married today, by the way. They got five children together. He's preaching down in, in, in Corpus, Texas. So, I mean, those things happen. But she went. You've you got to be willing to go. Alright, so let's keep going. I want you to look at verse 16. I love these principles. See, these are great. It says, And the damsel was fair to look upon. She, she's, she's an attractive young lady. Now let's listen, listen to this. Is it, is it okay to look for somebody that's attractive? Absolutely. Just remember, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. What's attractive to you may not be attractive to me. But you know, it's not wrong. I, you know, I want you to find someone you find attractive. You know, someone says, well, I, you know, she's, you know, her, he, he's got great qualities, but I'm just not very attracted to him. Well, then go pursue him. I mean, I, I, I don't want you to marry Mr. Ugly. I want you to marry somebody you, you think is, you know, handsome young ladies. And, and listen, guys, I want you to marry someone you think's pretty. All right? So she was fair. You know, he, she, this is a fair looking young lady. But look at the next, I think the most important part we miss. You guys underline this with me? Circle the word. She was a virgin. She had never known a man. This is a young lady that waited and saved herself. This is a young lady who saved herself for that special someone. She went down to the well. She filled her pitcher and came up. There's something else about this young lady. She was a working young lady. She wasn't sitting on the couch and just, just texting all day long. She wasn't sitting Twittering and Facebooking and, and, and whatever else that, that young ladies might do today. She, you know, she got out of the house. She, she was doing the chores. She was showing herself, listen, there are some things that, that my father expects me to do. One of those things is I've got to take care of feeding or watering the livestock. And I'm going to do it. And so she was out there looking. And so saving oneself until marriage is so important. Of all the principles we're going to look at, this, is, uh, this has got to rank at the very top. Purity. Young men and young ladies, save yourself until marriage. Now I want to talk about how you do that. Because we live in a world that does not respect this at all. You know, when Paul wrote to the Corinthian brethren, he said, you know, there's fornication that's existing here that's no, not even named among the Gentiles. You know, he wrote to a church that was known to be a fornicating church. I'm afraid today, if the Apostle Paul was writing a lot of churches of Christ, he would be writing to churches of Christ that would be known as fornicating churches. Because there are so many young people that are, have abandoned God's role for purity. And there are parents who have given up. And there are parents who, 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 who said, yeah, no, it's just kind of the society we live in. Young people, I want you to understand how he's, he, th this is so important that you remain pure until the, your wedding night. I'm going to show you how to, because God tells you how to do it. Again, how many of you recognize this picture right here? The, ladies, this right here, girls... What color is she wearing? What color is it? What color does the bride wear? White. Right? Why does the bride wear white? 
Well, why, why, why does the why does the, the preacher say who gives this woman in marriage? Friends, it's more than tradition. This right here is supposed to mean she has saved herself until her wedding night. It's one of the biggest frauds in a marriage ceremony today. Because we realize this isn't being done. God has a plan to keep you pure. And I want to share with you in the next few minutes how you do that. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. God kind of gives us a, 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 some help on how to be pure. He said, for this is the will of God. This is what God wants in your life. Even your sanctification, you abstain from fornication. God says, you got to stop. you got to abstain from it. That every one of you should know how to, this is the key, how to possess his vessel. How do you control yourself? How, how, how do you possess your vessel? Because if you're gonna if you're gonna keep abstaining from fornication, here's what you gotta you gotta learn how to possess your vessel. You gotta learn the, the value of self control or God control, which is a better term. Galatians five, because I believe that's what he's talking about. You you get under the influence of God. If you don't learn that, you're 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 not gonna be able to abstain from fornication. See see, we live in this world where the the body the body has become the the body has become the God. And, and, and I, even in the church, there are some of us, I believe, who, 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 who come to a, a point where we are willing to teach and even say this. You know, we just can't control ourselves. Men are just these animals that just have no control over their eyes. They have no control over their hands. You know, it's just, it just, it just part of human nature. I want you to understand something. It, it, the, the young men can control themselves and young ladies can be pure. And this is, it's very possible. In fact, if you learn how to possess your vessel, you can walk down the aisle as a virgin. And you can deserve to wear the white. And young men can be the same. I want you to notice Matthew 5.28 says, But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman, young man, young man, if you want to walk down the aisle, you want to be pure before God, the, the thing you've got to learn real quickly about possessing your vessel is that adultery and fornication. Listen to this. Fornication does not start in the bedroom. Fornication starts in the boardroom. And these are the eyelids to your board. I'm talking about the mind. And you've got to learn to control your eyes. You've got to learn to, 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 to look away. At the youngest of ages, I tried to teach my son, there are things that you, that you should not look on. And even today, we'll be walking at Walmart, and he'll go like this. And I'll see him, because there's a, there's a woman not dressed right. And he's not going to look. I'm so proud of my son when he does that. That's a lesson that every father needs to teach his, his son. There are th because in fathers, that means that you don't look. That means fathers, if you teach him, I'm not looking at that, so I'm going the other way. That we guard, we guard our boardroom. We guard it right here. Not, I'm not talking about the bedroom. Because fornication doesn't start there. It's, it starts here. It starts here. And we have to understand that principle. I want to, I want to go out and spend a lot of time here. I want you to go to the Song of Solomon. There's, there's something here. Young ladies, young men, go to the Song of Solomon. And there, there, there's, there, there is some, some divine instruction of how to be pure until the day you're married. I want to give you three verses. They all say the same thing. But these three verses are pivotal. And, 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 and God is teaching you something about how to possess your vessel. In chapter... In chapter uh, Two, this is right before the marriage ceremony. She's she's uh, she's infatuated with Solomon. I mean, she she she's in love with Solomon. Solomon is love with her, but she has this meeting with her friends, her young maidens. In verse seven, I want you to notice what the Bible says. I charge you. She gives him a charge. She said, "I ordered you. I need your help." Oh, ye daughters of Jerusalem. She's talking by the rows and by the hinds of the fields. Now listen to this. Stir not up or awake my love until it pleases. I want you to circle the word awake. You say, well, this is just a poetic verse. No, it's much more than that. This is God's inspired recipe on how to be pure until the day you're married. I'm going to share with you something. What she says is, you keep this part of your life asleep. Don't allow it to wake up. You, young ladies, listen to me carefully, young men. You've got to keep this part of your life sleeping. Amen. Do not allow it to wake up. 
Because once it wakes up, because you have looked at pornography, or you've allowed your mind to drift somewhere it shouldn't, it's so hard to put it back to sleep. It's much easier to keep it sleeping. I want you to go to chapter 3. I want you to look at verse 5. Now she's engaged. She's, in, she's about to get married. But surely you're just about to get married. It's all right. No, it's not all right. In verse 5, I charge you, O ye daughters of Jerusalem, by the rose and the hinds of the field, that you don't stir it up. Don't awake it. Keep it sleeping. Young ladies, young men, keep this part of your life asleep until you're ready for marriage. That means you've got to put boundaries up. That means you've got to put boundaries up with the time you spend, the places you go, how far you're allowed to go. One kiss, if there's a kiss at all. I mean, you've got to talk about this because you've got to know, I've got to possess my vessel. And, and, and you've got to understand that if you're going to possess your vessel, know what, how far I can go because I can't let this wake up. I want to share with you something. I want you to circle the word awake in verse 5. This, this is, th these words are not an accident. God put them here for us. In chapter 4, they get married. Chapter 4, I cannot go over chapter 4 with you tonight. I, I don't have time. But chapter 4 is a description of their wedding night. But there's a really important word in chapter 4 that really brings home the point. I want you to go to verse 16. And I want you to look at the first word. And I want you to circle it. The word says, awake. I want you to look at the word in chapter 3, verse 5. Awake. In verse 5, she says, don't let him wake up. Now, in verses 1 through 15 of chapter 4, he's talking. He does all the talking on the wedding night. The only recorded words we have of his bride are in verse 16. And she looks at her husband and she says, awake, O north wind, come thou south. Let the spices flow out. Let my beloved come into his garden. Let him eat his precious fruits. In other words, she says it's time to wake up. Isn't that beautiful? Wouldn't it be wonderful on the wedding night you can say, listen, I kept this sleeping all up until my wedding night. And now it wakes up. Now the relationship is holy and it's pure. Because I kept it sleeping when I needed to keep it sleeping. You want to be pure? You follow these principles. You do what the Bible says regarding keeping it sleeping. Let's go to the next principle. It's protective. I want you to go to Luke chapter 24, verses 23 and 24. We're back to the account here. I want you to notice when the, the servant approaches her. And, 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 and of course, he, he's just amazed at this young lady. Because not only does she draw water out for her livestock, she draws water out for his livestock. This is a hardworking young lady. One of the things, young ladies and young men, that you need to learn in your youth is work hard. You need to learn the value of hard work. Not everything needs to be given to you. You need to learn that you need to work for stuff. She was, she was a hard working... I don't have time to go into all that, but look at verse 23. He said, this is what the servant says to this young lady. Whose daughter art, art thou? Might I ask you a question tonight, young ladies? Whose daughter are you? You know what that verse implies? That she had a protector. That there was, a, there was somebody, whether a father, there was somebody in her home. And we talked about this ownership concept, but that protected her. That was going to care for her. And he realized that I've got to get permission. That I've got to go to, to dad or whoever else. And I, I just can't, you know, can we just disrespect this today. Now think about the dating, as, as I defined it. Think about the dating scene. Is dad even consulted? Friends, sometimes dad doesn't even know who, what's going on. You know what dad is today? Let me show you what dad is today. Let's just be honest. Here's what dad is. This is what we've turned dads into. Dad, I need money. I'm going out. Who are you going out with? Now, dad, you're not supposed to ask me that. You know what we turned dad into? A wallet. Friends, that's the least important. Dad, that's the least important thing you'll give. That's the a, that's a least important. That, do you see what the scriptures are telling us is that, that whose daughter out there, in other words, she, she understands there's a protector somewhere. 
There's someone that, that she belongs to. And, and if you say, listen, I don't have a spiritually minded dad. I don't have a Christian dad. Then you go to an elder. You go to a preacher. You, you find a married couple. And you say to them, would you help me find a godly mate? And I can tell you somebody that you all have. You all have a father who cares. It's your heavenly father. Amen. I want you to think about this, young people, that we call him our father because we have a relationship with him. You use the term father and mother as terms of relationships. And you know, aren't you his daughter? Aren't you his son? Isn't there a relationship that we share together? So we all have it. I'm going to go to my last point. This last point is, is again, right on the top. I want you to look here at patience. How patient was Isaac? And how patient was Rebecca? How patient are you? How many of you have asked this question, when will I find Mr. Wright? And Lord, how long are you going to make me wait? How long must I wait? I want to submit to you something. Did you know that Isaac, this is chapter 25, was 40 years old before he found his wife? So young ladies, I'm going to submit something to you. If you're 18 years old and you've never had a boyfriend, your life isn't over. If you're 20 years old and you're not married, you're not an old maid. Life isn't over. There are worse things than marriage. You marry the wrong person, there are worse things than marriage. Isaac was 40. In other words, he waited 40 years. And you say, well, Lord, I've been praying, preacher, don't you? I've been praying. Well, keep praying and be patient. You know, the fear of being alone makes some feel if they're not in a relationship, there's something wrong. I mean, there must be something wrong with me. I'm 19 and I've never even had a girlfriend. If you're a young man, if you're 19 and you never had a girlfriend, it's all right. Because I was 19 and I never had a girlfriend. And I can give you the name and a list of a lot of other guys just like that. I could have had a girlfriend, but I didn't. I was waiting. I, I wanted to find that person that could help me go to heaven, so I was waiting. Young ladies, if you're 19 and you've never had a boyfriend, it's all right. My wife had never had a boyfriend either. She was just waiting. She wasn't going to play the game. She wasn't going to go through the heartache and the hurts and the tissue boxes. That wasn't going to happen. I'm waiting for that person that's going to help me go to heaven. And so if, I, if I'm 19 and I find him or her, that's great. But it may not be until I'm 25 or 35, but that's all right. Because all of us in this room have seen what happens when you marry the wrong person, haven't we? Mm -hmm. How many of you know people in your family that married the wrong person? Do you really want to go through that? Let me share with you what the dating scene looks like today. Boyfriend, 12. Dating, 13. Steady, 14. Serious relationship. I don't know what that means, but 15. May I ask a question? What are you doing at 16 and 17? Isn't that the problem? Because there's only one more step to take and you're not ready for it. You're not even close to being ready. We wonder why we have a fornication problem in our country. And can I just be honest and say in the churches of Christ? Let me share with you some numbers. 12-year-olds who date are 90% more likely to become sexually active before marriage. 90%. 15-year-olds who date are 60% more likely to become sexually active before marriage, 17 year olds, and look at the numbers, just 12%. So what, what is that telling us? That there's, there's a vast difference here, maturity, there's something developing, you're not ready. I'm going to share with you some other things. Those who marry before age 20 have the greatest likelihood of divorce. I'm not telling you it's a sin to marry before 20. My parents were married before 20. Your parents may have been married before 20. I know there's cultural considerations, a lot of other factors. 
But I'm just saying statistically, if you want to know what it looks like, those who wait until they're 21 increase their likelihood of having a 10-year relationship in marriage by 60%. Isaiah 40, 31 says, But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Let me give you a couple things to think about. Because a lot of people, this is, this, is, this is right here the kicker for a lot of young ladies especially. I'm not trying to pick on you young ladies, but there's a lot of young ladies who think, hey, Listen, I don't have a boyfriend. I, I, and they get desperate. And they're willing to compromise their principles because they just don't want to be alone. I want to give you something to think about. You are never alone when you walk with God. Yeah. And you may not have a boyfriend, but you don't have to have a boyfriend to go to heaven. That's right. You must accept God's timetable. And God's timetable is not our timetable. And although you... I, I, here, here's, if you're, you're like my sister, you've got everything planned out. You, know, you even know when you're getting married. You picked a month out already. You're, you're just 14. You even know, you got your dress picked out. You what is that? Pinterest, Pinterest. You've got it all mapped out. I mean, you know what's going on. Let me, let me help you understand. Your timetable is not always God's timetable. If you try to force it, you know what's going to happen. You must allow God to answer your prayers. Stop trying to interfere. Stop trying to reject what He's saying. Let God answer your prayers. So if you're praying for a faithful Christian, wait for a faithful Christian. Your life is not over if you don't have a boyfriend or a girlfriend. You need to get that. It's all right. You know, some it seems like today, you know, I drive the church bus sometimes, you know, and you take the young people, take the middle school young people. You take the middle school young people, you take them to a youth event, and you just listen to what they talk about the whole trip. Someone's boyfriend, someone's girlfriend. It's incredible. I mean, we've got to have a boyfriend. Because that's what our society says. I mean, if, if we're not talking about that, then we're just not somebody. You know, when God says we're peculiar people, He meant that. We're not like the world. We're, we're preparing. We're, looking, we're, we're living a different life. Dear friends, you cannot live the life of the world and expect the results of God. There are worse things in being single. You can be a faithful Christian and be single. Don't forget that. Courtship has marriage as its end goal. Therefore, we must consider if a person is ready for the responsibilities of marriage. I don't know many 16 or 17 year old teens who are ready for marriage. I just don't know them. So you think about when should I begin this process? When should I begin looking for? Because when you start looking for someone, it's probably a pretty good odds you're going to find something. Life is not over if you're single. We must remember what Paul wrote in Philippians 4 and 11. Not that I speak in regard to need. For I have learned in whatsoever state I am to be content. So you've got to learn to be content if you're single. You just pray and you wait. Remember Paul was not married. And he was content. So it's possible for you to grow up and not even marry. I'm not encouraging that. I think you need to get married. I, the Bible teaches that marriage is good. I want, I, I want every young person here to get married. As long as it's to a faithful Christian. Here's the principles. We're closing. Last slide. Here's what I want you to leave here. Regardless of what you call this, dating, courtship, whatever term you want to use, can we all agree in this room that these things are biblical? The parents need to have a role? That we need to trust our parents? Can we all agree in this room that our relationships need to be pointed towards marriage? And if we can't, if we can't see marriage with this person, then what are we doing? Playing with fire. Can we all agree, number three, that we need to be looking for faithful Christians? That the places we look are important? Because wherever you're hanging, whatever you're looking for, wherever you're at, you're going to find, you're going to find what's there. That's why Bible camps like this are so important. And no one in here may ever marry someone in here. But it may be tonight that we've got one, two, or three young people right here that someday you're going to get married to somebody in this room. 
Would you agree that prayer is important? Yeah. We need to be praying about this. Would you agree that you need to wait on the providence of God? You need to stop rushing ahead of God. You know, Jonah, he got excited. He just started to rush ahead of God. You see where that got him? Wait on God. Would we all agree that purity is vital? And we need to take steps in our life to remain pure. The purity is not an accident. I'll say this, young lady, young man. If you walk down the wedding aisle and you say, I do. And you're honestly able to say when he says, who gives this woman in marriage? I give. You haven't given yourself up, young ladies. You've reserved yourself for your husband. If you can go through that whole process, I promise you this is true. It wasn't an accident. You had a plan in your life to be pure. You will not accidentally remain pure. Young men, you will, it was not a, You have to have a plan in place. How about patience? Can we all agree that we need to be patient? Several years ago, I co-authored a book called Engage. The whole purpose of the book was to try to, to encourage young people to put these principles in their life. To, to, to re-examine what we're doing. I mean, anyone who's honest can say this. We should be able to look at what's been going on for the last several generations and know we have got a serious problem. Something's broken. You know how you fix it? You take this book and you put the principles back in it. Yeah. I appreciate your time and consideration tonight. I'm going to close with this. Over 20 years ago, there was a, there was a young man who lived in San Antonio, Texas. And he thought that he was never going to find a wife. He had almost given up. In fact, he, he had spent some time going to Bible camps and, and visiting churches. He went to a Bible chair. But he just couldn't find her. He prayed. It wasn't as if he couldn't have a girlfriend. The girls were there, but he wasn't about to go out with those girls because he didn't trust himself. He thought, if I go out with those girls, I know where it's going to lead. So I'm not doing it. In Nashville, Tennessee, at the same time, there's this young lady. And um, she never had a boyfriend. And she was waiting. She was looking. She was praying. She ended up going to Fried Hardman University. And she ended up being a roommate of this young man's sister. His mother visited, and she met this young lady. She looked over at this boy's sister and said, You know what? I think I just found your brother's wife. He's just like her. He likes the same things as she... she they're just... Everything seems to, to match up. Chrissy, you got to get her to come back to San Antonio. Invite her to come home for spring break. So she asked me, and she said, I'll come. I'll come to Texas for spring break. And so the morning she was supposed to leave, she got cold feet. And she told her roommate, I'm not going. I'm going home. I'm going to go back home. Chrissy was so inf infuriated. She says, no, you got to come. She said, I don't want to go. If you know this woman, when she makes her mind up, it's hard to change her mind. So my, so, so, so. Chrissy calls her mother and says, tell her to go to Texas. And her mother says, listen, you may not go to Texas, but you're not coming to my house for spring break. <laughs> so she went to Texas. I'd worked all night long at a grocery store and I was exhausted. But I can still remember when that door opened and my sister walked in. Nicole was right behind her. My friend Mel was over at the house. I turned over to Mel. I pushed him into my bedroom. I said, Mel, I said, you've had a lot of girlfriends in your life, but this one's for me. <laughs> and I meant every word of it. I was 20 years old. She was 20 years old. Our relationship didn't, wasn't identical to Genesis 24, but the principles were there. Young people, if you'll do what this book says, God will take care of you. Yeah. You've got to be peculiar, be brave, and courageous. 
but the results are wonderful. Thank you for your time and attention. I understand I'm supposed to offer an invitation. Is that right? Let me let me do that real quickly. Um, there may be some young people here tonight that need prayer. You've been uh, you've been maybe you've been struggling in your life. You, you've not lived as you should. Maybe something we've said in this this um, this this uh, this class is you're thinking about. It, so I need to make some changes in my life. That's why we're here. You're among friends, and although I've not met almost just very few of you, I feel like we're family, and we are. And so you're you're among the, the best place to, to, to come forward and to ask for strength and you need help. You, you say, I, help me be stronger. Help, help me be pure. That's why we're here. If you're not a Christian and, and you want to be a Christian, the, the Scriptures tell us what to do. If you want to tonight, if you have faith in Christ and you're willing to confess His name, repent of your sins and be baptized to be a Christian, have your sins washed away. Whatever the case may be tonight, you're, you're, this opportunity is for you. So if we can help you in any way, would you would you indicate would you come forward as we stand and as we sing? You are my strength when I am weak. You are my treasure that I see.